you to all the seniors that are here. This is your last year of club. So thank you for being so supportive and always being here at 7 in the morning for years now. Um, it's been awesome to have you guys and we're going to miss you. And especially to Claire, who's been the head of journal club for two and a half years now, and she has made this what it is.
Um, the mortality rate was about 2.5%, which was much higher than any previous flu virus um, that was measured. Um, the United States uh, Army actually is one of the best resources for data about the influenza virus and the number of people who actually were infected by the influenza virus. So they extrapolated um, that about 25% of the entire American population had the flu virus in 1918 and 1919. Um, this information I'm getting from an environmental historian's work on the 1918 virus um, that was published actually before the genome was mapped. Um, one of the ways it spread so quickly was the fact that American men were being sent over to Europe in the hundreds of thousands in a few months span. So originate, originating in the United States, they think maybe around Kansas, maybe in Massachusetts, not quite sure where, but sending as many American troops over as they did actually exacerbated the spread of the virus because they were essentially shipping it over to Europe where it would spread from there. Um, it started in March 1918. By July, it had made its way around the world, essentially. Um, and it killed between 20, at the very uh, sort of low estimate, to 50 million people. Um, in the article, if you read the article that I read, um, they were pegging it at about 50 million people worldwide were killed as a result of the flu. Now, it wasn't just the flu virus, there's also complications of the flu virus. A lot of people died of pneumonia, um, complications after getting the virus because their immune systems were extremely weakened. Um, you'll see why uh, they might have died from pneumonia when I get to the results of the journal article. Um, and then here is, um, this sort of works, doesn't work. Um, here is a um, poster from the American Department of Public Health warning people about the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, part of the problem, too, with uh, this pandemic in particular is that the Department of Public Health didn't really know what to do. There was no quarantine. They actually had uh, American soldiers crowded into camps, which exacerbated the spread and, and made it spread faster. Um, and as I said, they didn't diagnose it correctly to begin with. They didn't know what they were deal with, dealing with. Um, so, you know, part of the, some historians argue that this particular strain, uh, strain of flu actually altered the course of World War I. It might have gone longer, there might have been a different outcome, had not so many thousands of soldiers died and people died, and it weakened sort of the human capacity um, that was fueling World War I. Um, now to the article itself. So, the article itself um, is a pretty, it's a pretty small study, which I find kind of problematic to some degree, because they only have 10 animals that are test animals. And of course, you have the sort of ethics of using uh, you know, live animals as a subject for doing scientific experiments, especially when they know that the end outcome will be mutation. Um, but that's another thing we can discuss. Uh, but there's only 10 that this group of people in um, a, li a laboratory in Winnipeg, Canada, um, decided to infect them with the 1918 virus, which was actually mapped, the genome was mapped in 2005, and it was published in Nature. Um, this is a 2007 article in Nature that I'm talking about. So just a few years after they mapped the genome of the virus, they chose to do non-human non primate experiments. There had been one experiment done on mice before, and they found that it was extremely virulent, it was extremely deadly, but of course mice are not humans, um, and they wanted to test something on uh, an animal that was as similar as you could get to the human homo sapiens and see what the effects might be. Um, so that's kind of the goal of the study itself, was just to look at the virus-host interaction and see if they could determine why um, the virus was so extremely virulent. So as I said, they had a small study. Um, and one thing to note, too, I was talking to Dr. Drexilio about the sort of methodology conducted at a biosafety level four um, ex sort of laboratory, which means the highest level of security available, meaning that there's no cure for this uh, vaccine, and it's up there with smallpox in terms of you know, its deadly nature. Um, so these researchers took 10 macaque monkeys, infected three with the uh, sort of common uh, human influence virus, K173, that's what they called it. And then they infected seven with the 1918 virus that they had reconstituted using the genome that was mapped uh, in 2005. And 
what they did was um, use the K173 animals as control animals. Um, and at phase three, six, and eight, euthanized one control um, macaque or, and two or three um, macaques that had the 1980 virus and did various sort of tests on different parts of their body. What I'm gonna be focusing on is the data that was found from the swabs, tissue swabs, um, the tests on the blood serum, and then also gene expression as matched by the looking at the mRNA. Um, and all of these together sort of show the extreme virulence of the 1918 virus and its potential danger to um, you know, humans <laughs> if it ever was released again into the human population. Um, so here, you may not be able to tell very well, but this is, um, if you come closer, or I can send it to you if you want, or if you have a copy of the journal article, you can look at it. This is uh, tissue samples that were taken from macaques on days three and eight. Um, and these are the different types of tissue samples that were taken. So sample from the, um, the nose, the heart, the spleen, and then uh, uh, the lungs, and then the bronchi and tonsils. It's a lot of the respiratory system. Um, the control is green, and uh, the unit of measurement is platforming unit, so the, essentially the amount of virus that was found in these tissue samples in these different areas of the body. The control, the K-173 uh, animal,
but it indicates that you know this is the expression of this particular gene and indicating that the body itself doesn't know what to do with this particular letter. Third metric um, that was used to sort of measure the virulence of this particular virus um, was uh, microarray analysis done on gene expression of um, those cytokines and chemokines. Um, and this is the best graph. There's three different graphs, um, but this is the one I did to sort of visually represent the difference between chemo 73 and 1918 um, virus. So this is uh, genes that were taken from bronchi in the cox, I think three, six, and eight. The red um, is meaning positive fold change, meaning that um, the body is upregulating the emission of cytokines or chemokines. Um, so meaning that it's, it's emitting those genes more, meaning that it's trying to fight the body more, or fight the virus in the, the virus in the body more. The green means that it's downregulated meaning that the gene expression is going back to quote unquote normal. Um, on the left, you can see K173. So here, both animals essentially have red. The genes are upregulated, the gene expression is upregulated. But in K173 on day six and day eight, it's going green. So it's downregulated, going back to normal. Whereas in 1918, it continues to have positive fold change for gene expression of those cytokines body is it's just another way of representing the body is still fighting off that, that infection, it's still attempting to fight off the infection, and it's abnormal, it's atypical, because the typical uh, virus reaction would be totally different, it would be sort of downregulated, it would be total human influence virus. Last thing to think about when it's, um, you know, the one of the last things they measured when they looked at the animals. So, I'm going to show you some images. Thinking that the people who labeled the 19, the people who had the 1918 virus who died of it in 1918, the purple death, which of these lungs do you think represents the 1918 infected bronchi? Which one? I know I have to brush you out the
what are the ethics of actually regenerating a virus that had been eliminated? Not to say that it wouldn't come back again, that it wouldn't mutate again. They think it's a, a variation of an avian flu. Um, but why actually purposely recreate it and do experiments with it, especially if you have to have it in a biosafety level? The virus safety level four, is there like any history of failures of that? Like how consistent has it been proven to affect these cases? Well, I know smallpox <laughs> got out from an old NIH facility last year in the United States. Smallpox, which you know is not a nice disease. It strikes, it strikes me that the answer to that question relies a lot on how well our capacity to contain the disease is.